Peace and blessings, family. How is everyone doing? Thank you all for joining me for another session. Welcome new and returning listeners. I hope that you all are well, staying in peace and not allowing yourself to get stressed out with everything that's going on right now. You have to, have to trust the Most High with everything that's happening around us, family. Just know that he has it all under control. Well, welcome again to the new listeners. Thanks for joining me. Peace and blessings to all of you. How you doing, Brother Clifford, Patricia, Brother Calvin? How you doing? I'm, not, I'm gonna try not to keep you so late tonight where you need the coffee. How you doing, Thea, Hadassah, Shava, Mr. The Original School? How you doing? How you doing? B. Smith, how are you? Jesse, Kenneth, Terry, Sharia, Sharia. Diamond Love. How you doing, Sister Diamond? Let's see. Priscilla, A Cool or A Call? P. Thomas, The Whole Truth, So Help Me, Yah. <laughs> In Yah's Grip. How you doing, Sister Maria? Chosen Daughter of Zion. Marilyn, Miriam, Azania, Yabu. Yabu. Anita, Miss Love, Mavet, Nidra, Marcia, Jezuria. Old McMoney finally caught alive. Well, good for you. Welcome to the live. Jessica, Valeria, Seed of Jake, Janet, Colored Girl, Lamp of Oil, Ray Chant Chantel, Jeff, how you doing? Vita Yaz, Child, Eliu, uh, Deborah, how are you? Lisa, Cassie, Avi, all praise to Yah. These I views Quad Mayel, Rachel Anthony. Okay. Ooh, it's a lot of you. How you doing, Brother Don P. Carl? So much media. KT Malak Clifford. All right. It's a lot of you. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started. I'll be here all night. Welcome, 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 and peace and blessings to all of you. So, you all, we've been covering a lot in this series. It's beginning to feel like a history class, don't you think? We are, well, let's see, we'll be at 16 for this next lesson. I'm just like, oh my word. Hopefully you have been taking notes because there is a lot to unpack with this. It's time for the hidden things, though, to be revealed. So we are nearing the end of the series, you all. Time for the nations to reap. As I said, we will be in 16 for the next one. How many of you were surprised to learn about the Afro-Turks? Was that a surprise for any of you? Because people are like, Turks, really? <laughs> Turks? But yeah, I mean, it's a fulfillment of prophecy, is it not? We have people all around the world. Here they call us African-Americans, Afro-Americans. We have people in other places, the Afro-Turks, the Afro-Brazilians, Afro-Syrians, Afro-Mexicanos, Afro-Caribbeans, and folks in other parts of the world. We've truly truly been spread out. One of the Limba elders said, we're not lost, we're scattered. And that is certainly the truth. That is certainly the truth. Chizuri says, I knew we were there. I didn't know Turkey's history with us. Mm -hmm. Yes, we are literally everywhere. The Most High was punishing us and hiding us at the same time. Hiding us, because truly these folks have tried to wipe us out, but he wouldn't allow it. He reserved for himself a remnant. Praise Yah for that. So as I said, we have a lot to get into. Time for the nations to be judged. 
And we're going to be talking about some things that they skip, some things they don't want to talk about. Because interestingly, Christians are beside themselves as they watch what's happening right now. And in that place they call the Middle East, they're thinking that they're going to be raptured any day now. But it's strange how they conveniently skipped over the prophecy in Joel 3 about how the nations that enslaved the Most High's people would be judged. How is it that they skipped that part? But we'll get to that near the end. So let's get into this because I have some other things that I want to cover and, and hang in there with me because I'm going to be connecting some dots again. Some of you say, man, I had to listen to this thing three times. You had so much in here. But yeah, well, it's a, it's a history lesson for me too, some of it. But let's get going with this. So we're going to get started by asking this question. What did Nebuchadnezzar see? What did he see? I covered that a couple months ago where I was talking about um, the book of Daniel and how Nebuchadnezzar wanted those called wise men to not only interpret his dream, they had to tell him the dream. So we're going to go back to some of old Nebi's dream what did he see and how does it connect to what we see happening now? Let's go back and look at the book of Daniel. And I'm, on, I'm going to read this from the Septuagint. So some things may read a bit differently. If you've never read the Septuagint's version, you, version, you can actually Google that um, and just pull it up if you want to read through it. So let's read this. We're looking at Daniel 2, 1 through 3. It says, in the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed a dream and his spirit was amazed and his sleep departed from him. And the king gave orders to call the enchanters and the magicians and the sorcerers and the Chaldeans to declare to the king his dreams. And they came and stood before the king, and the king said to them, I have dreamed, and my spirit was troubled to know the dream. So the dream caused this man to lose sleep. So you notice here that it says he calls some folks in, and this is where we need to pay attention. Notice that the folks he calls in they're identified by certain functions, enchanters, magicians, sorcerers, and then Chaldean is just kind of thrown in there. Why wouldn't they be listed under enchanters, magicians, and sorcerers? Why are they being named? Why are they being named? So we need to pause here so that we can look at some things. Let's look at this. The Chaldeans of ancient Mesopotamia, the Chaldeans in the Bible. It says the Chaldeans may be best known from the Bible. There they are associated with the city of Ur and the biblical patriarch Abraham, who was born in Ur. When Abraham left Ur with his family, the Bible says they went out together from Ur of the Chaldeans to go into the land of Canaan. The Chaldeans pop up in the Bible again and again. For example, they are part of the army. Nebuchadnezzar II, king of, of Babylon, uses to surround Jerusalem. Huh, Nebuchadnezzar used them to surround Jerusalem, the Chaldeans. That's found in 2 Kings 25. So again, we need to pause and think about some things here. 
we need to know more about these Chaldeans. Abraham was born in the Chaldean culture. Think about that. So who are the Chaldeans? It says the country of Chaldea was an ancient land in southern Babylonia on the Persian Gulf near the delta of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. In biblical times, the name was applied to all of Babylonia. As far as can be traced, the Chaldeans themselves descend from Shem's son Arphaxad, who is also an ancestor of Abraham and Israel. So the Chaldeans are associated with Babylon and the city of Ur because they settled near Babylon and in Shinar. In fact, the most powerful Babylonian dynasty, Neo-Babylonia, was Chaldean, as was its most powerful and most famous king, Nebuchadnezzar. However, some Chaldeans settled farther north around Lake Van, about halfway between the Mediterranean Sea and the Caspian Sea. There they came to be called Chaldeans and more often the people of Van. So keep this information in mind because we want to dig a little deeper. So, Notice that Nebuchadnezzar identified certain functions, sorcerers. You know, usually people just say the wise men. So let's look at this article that talks about the astrologer versus the Chaldean. Because when people talk about the Chaldeans, they say, oh, they were astrologers. So what are the meanings? What's the meaning and the differences? It says, are you confused about the difference between an astrologer and a Chaldean? He named them for a reason. It says, you're not alone. While the two terms are often used interchangeably, they actually have distinct meanings and origins. So let's look at it. It says, an astrologer is someone who studies the movements and relative positions of, of celestial bodies and uses this information to interpret human affairs and natural phenomena. The word astrologer comes from the Greek words astron, meaning star, and logos, meaning study of. So astrologers, astrologers use a variety of tools and techniques to create horoscopes, interpret birth charts, and make predictions about the future. If you're involved in any of that, repent and get rid of it. Stop it. So Chaldean, on the other hand, refers to a specific type of astrology that originated, it began in ancient Babylon. So think about Nimrod. So Chaldean astrology is based on the idea that each planet has a specific energy or vibration that can be used to interpret human affairs. The Chaldeans were known for their expertise in astronomy and astrology. Think about that now. And it talks about how their work talks about how their work influenced the development of Western astrology. Pause and think on that. Their work influenced the development of Western astrology. Hmm. So let's define an astrologer. An astrologer is a person who studies the movements and relative positions of celestial bodies, like we just said. Astrology is an ancient practice that dates back to the Babylon, the Babylonians. All right, so we, they use different things so that they can try to predict future events. But now let's define what a Chaldean is, because they're not just talking about a race, a group of people. Chaldean is associated with numerology. 
Chaldean numerology is a system of numerology that is based on the ancient Babylonian and Chaldean traditions. It assigns numerical values to letters and uses these values to analyze a person's name, birth date, and other things. You all, there are some people standing in pulpits today using numerology to interpret scripture, believe it or not. So Chaldean numerology is based on the idea that each letter has a unique vibration and energy that can be used to understand a person's character and destiny. The Chaldean system is considered to be more accurate than other forms of numerology because it takes into account the vibrations of the letters and the impact they have on a person's life. Did you all know this about the Chaldeans? Did you all know this? <laughs> because for some of this, I'm going, hmm, really? Okay. So yes, when never ne when Nebuchadnezzar made a point of saying, bring in the Chaldeans, he knew that they had something extra. They were adding a little bit more sauce in there. How you doing, Mary C? It's been a while, sis. She says, no, I didn't know that. You all, if you have not visited her channel, be sure to do that. I tune in every now and then when I get a chance. But yes, the Kias is new to me, chosen daughter of Yah. No, no, I didn't know some of this stuff either. But like I said, hang in there because you're going to see how some of this is going to fit together. Now, family. Can you think of a group of people who rely on numerology to predict what's going to happen? Put it in the chat. Can you think of a group of people? They are known for it. They rely on numerology. And that is really how they interpret what they call Yah's word. Let's see. Any of you know of anyone? Mm -hmm. Egyptians, conservatives, Arabs, Berbers, mm -hmm. Europeans. Yes, Lisa. Yes, Kabbalists. <laughs> yes. Big time, big time. Yes, simply CC. So everything that we see happening right now, these, per, these people are trying to read the tea leaves because they think they can stay ahead of the most high. Keep that in mind. You got it, Brother Micah. So yes, but also people like Alice A. Bailey, you don't want to read anything she wrote. She was one of them. But those who use Kabbalah and other esoteric forms of divination and mysticism, it's the occult family. It's the occult. But let's keep going. So now that you have an understanding of who the Chaldeans were, let's continue reading. We're looking at Daniel 2, 4 through 12. And the Chaldeans spoke to the king in the Syrian language. Um, the King James text says the Aramaic language. So the Chaldeans spoke up first saying, O king, live forever. Do thou tell the dream to thy servants? And we will declare the interpretation. The king answered the Chaldeans, the thing has departed from me. If ye do not make known to me the dream and the interpretation, you, you're going to be destroyed. Look, not just you and your houses, 
But if you make known to me the dream and the interpretation, you will receive of me gifts and presents and much honor. But tell me the dream and the interpretation. So they answered a second time. Now pay attention to who's talking. Let the king tell the dream to his servants and we will declare the interpretation. And the king answered, I verily know that you are trying to gain time because you see that the thing has gone from me. If then you do not tell me the dream, I know that you have concerted to utter before me a false and corrupt tale until the time shall have passed. So I'm asking you to tell me my dream. And you're saying, but but no, tell us what your dream is. No, I want you to tell me the dream. You're trying to waste time. And then you're going to make up something. And then it won't be what I what I dream. So he's saying, no, tell me the dream. And I will know that you will also declare to me the interpretation. So if you have enough power to tell me what my dream was, I'll know that you gave me the correct interpretation. Now, this is, when you think about it, it's like he's asking something that's impossible for a human being to do. And that's basically what the Chaldeans are going to say to him. Like, this this is impossible here, (laughs) Nebi. Think about what you're asking us to do. It says the Chaldeans answered before the king and said, there is no man on the earth who can make known the king's matter for as much as no great king or ruler asks such a question of an, listen, of an enchanter, a magician, or Chaldean. So they have pretty much set themselves apart as well. It's like they were at operating in their craft at a higher level than the enchanters and the magicians. Stay with me now. So they say, for the question which the king asks is difficult, and there is no one else who shall answer it before the king but the gods, whose dwelling is not with any flesh. So now the king is angry. He's in rage. He's commanding them to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. Note here, they're being called wise men. So all who were lumped in that, these astrologers, magicians, sorcerers, all of them were called wise men. And the king is now saying, you're all going to die. Why would that have been a problem for those folks being called before the king if they were serving the true God. Why is that a problem? Why not just get the information from your God? If you say only the gods can give this answer, why not go and ask your gods? The key point here, family, is that Nebuchadnezzar was testing those who claim to have wisdom and spiritual powers. They had to tell him what he dreamed and then give him the interpretation. No small feat. They couldn't do it. It proved that they were not empowered by the Most High. Several things are going on here. (laughs) They, these people, Chaldeans and the enchanters and others, along with this lesser king, little K, had to acknowledge the most high, the almighty king, as the supreme supreme being. And Nebuchadnezzar would, was being shown a dream that would affect Gentile rule or how the Gentile kingdoms would reign for a time and then be destroyed. The other thing happening here is that only the Most High's servant could interpret the dream that would later serve as a message to us in the last days. So don't miss the duality. This time clock represents the natural and the spiritual realm. 
that which is natural is first. So the Most High was exposing it for all to see that these people, they were calling wise men who supposedly had all this power, were fakes. Yeah, they were dibbling and dabbling in uh, fortune telling and, sor and sorcery, and they could do some stuff. Don't get me wrong. Some of these, these folks dibbling and dabbling in black magic, yes, they can do some stuff, but their power was no match for him. And what he could do, that's what the Most High was bringing out into the open right now. So in these last days, we're going to see that again. We're going to see some Elijah moments. He's going to make known those who belong to him versus those who do not. Those who are speaking words given to them by him versus those who have not, but they're saying they have the power. I hope you caught that. So the source of the power will be revealed, and yet there will be those who will not turn and repent. I'm talking about in these last days. The Most High will be doing things like this. He's going to make himself known, but there will still be those who will not repent because their deeds are evil and they love wickedness. They love wickedness. So now we're in a situation here where this king has commanded that all of the wise men be killed. Now, listen to what it says. They began to slay the wise men. So they started killing some of them and they sought Daniel and his fellows to slay them. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. They were trying to kill them as well because they were considered to be wise men. Now, this is leading to something, so hang in there. So Daniel was told what was happening. He goes and he asks the captain of the royal guard to give him some time. And he says, give me some time and I will tell the king his dream and his interpretation. So he goes and he consults with his friends. They pray, and the mystery was revealed to Daniel in the night vision. So Daniel has the interpretation. He saw Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Is there anything too hard for the Most High? Now let's read on to see what happened. So Arioch, in haste, brought in Daniel before the king and said to him, I have found a man. Listen of the children of the captivity of Judah. Even though this Gentile king was given this vision, this dream, that was a prophetic time clock, he had to go to Yah's servant. He had to go to an Israelite to get the correct interpretation. Don't miss that. But where were they? in captivity. They were in captivity. It says, I found a man of the children of the captivity of Judea, who will declare the interpretation to the king. And the king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Balthazar. They changed his name. They changed our names. Can you declare to me the dream which I saw and the interpretation thereof? And Daniel answered before the king and said, listen, the mystery which the king asks, the explanation of, is not in the power of the wise men, magicians, enchanters, or soothsayers to declare to the king. It's not in the power of any of these folks to tell you this mystery. Notice what Daniel is doing here. He's elevating the Most High making him supreme. It's like, I know the one, the almighty one who is in heaven, who is revealing mysteries. It's not about me, O king. It says he has made known 
to, to you what things must come to pass in the last days. Your dream and the visions of thy head upon thy bed are as follows. So he told him his dream. And then he says again, he that reveals mysteries has made known to thee what must come to pass for all of the servants of the most high. We are to point to him. We are to point people to him. We are nothing in our own strength. We can do no great thing. The power comes from him. His eyes are searching to and fro, looking for those he can show himself mighty through. So Daniel tells them, moreover, this mystery has not been revealed to me by reason of wisdom, which is in me beyond other living, others living. You know what he was avoiding here? Don't try to worship me as if I'm something great. Uh, no, I went to the source. I'm pointing you to the source. He says, he's the one telling you what this dream means. So don't miss that. So he saw the dream. And I hope you understand that our deliverance in these last days will also be used to make the most high known among the heathen. But just know there will be those who will reject him because they belong to the wicked one. They are of their father, the devil. So anyway, he told him about this dream and basically it's what's in this, what we see written concerning this, this statue here and the kingdoms that would be represented. The head of gold would, would be the Babylonian empire, the breast and arms of silver, the Medes and the Persians, the belly and thighs of brass, the Macedonian uh, or Greek empire, the legs of iron, the Roman empire, and then the feet and toes of clay which are connected to the legs of iron. So people normally try to separate the two, but the feet and toes of clay, those are the kingdoms that arose after the fall of the Roman, pop, Roman empire. All of those kingdoms came out of the same people. No, no different there, no difference. So let's go on. So we want to look at this. What did Nebuchadnezzar see? This Gentile king is given a dream that would prove to be the prophetic time clock of our captivity. Think about the condition of our people during this time. They were scattered and in subjection to other nations. So uh, Nebuchadnezzar was shown that he was the beginning and the head of Gentile kingdoms that would rule over us and the kingdom of heaven allowed it. So here's what's happening. The Supreme King was showing a timeline of events to a lesser king concerning his people. Nebuchadnezzar represented the lesser powers that would be allowed to rule in the earth until the highest power in heaven intervene. After that time, the kingdom of heaven would rule forever. So by telling the king the dream and the interpretation of it, Daniel helped to save the lives of the quote unquote wise men who were left because they killed some of it, some of them. And you would think they would have been grateful, but were they? Later, it would be the Chaldeans making accusations to the king that caused Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to be thrown into the fire. <laughs> but they were protected. So once again, it proved that they were serving the one true God. Now, so we need to know what Nebuchadnezzar saw. And then what did Daniel see? 
Nebuchadnezzar saw an image of these Gentile kingdoms. And he saw something grand and grandiose. It was splendid. Nebuchadnezzar saw his dominion in all its wealth and prosperity. And this is what Gentile nations focus on. Remember, that which is natural is first. But what did Daniel see? As you continue reading in the book of Daniel, he's also given a vision later that revealed the spiritual components of what Nebuchadnezzar saw. He saw the Gentile nations represented as beasts. Beasts, let that sink in. And later, what he saw in the spirit realm would be revealed in the natural. Nebuchadnezzar actually would begin behaving like what he was, a beast of the field. He was literally eating grass like an animal. Daniel was shown how the earth, to include the people of the Most High, would be trampled by the beast nations. So the Most High, the Almighty, the King of Kings, is showing this Gentile kings, like, I need you to know, I'm allowing this. But Nebuchadnezzar, <laughs> with his pride, didn't get it. And he started boasting. And the very day that he did it, he began behaving and acting like an animal, eating grass, you all eating grass. So let's read this, a portion of what Daniel saw was sealed up until the day of the end. So we're looking at Daniel 12, one through nine. It says, at that time, Michael, the great prince shall stand up that stands over the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of tribulation, such tribulation as has not been from the time that there was a nation on the earth until that time. At that time, thy people shall be delivered. This is the hour. This is the time. This is the season. Thy people shall be delivered. Even everyone that is written in the book. Now, this is where you just need to stop. Our names were written in a book before we ever went into captivity. Thy people shall be delivered. Even everyone that is written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth. So some of them are going to leave here, but some will remain as if some are sleeping. They passed on already. They shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to reproach and everlasting shame. And the wise shall, shall, sign, shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. And some of the many righteous as the stars forever and ever. And you, Daniel, close the words and seal the book to the to the time of the end. So Daniel was told what was happening. But listen to what he's told. Seal the book to the time of the end until many are taught and knowledge is increased. Many are taught and knowledge is increased. That's what's happening right now among our people. We're being taught. We're relearning. We're waking up and coming to ourselves. Seal the book to the time of the end until many are taught and knowledge is increased. I hope you're catching that part. So a portion of what Daniel saw was sealed up. Family, we need to be praying for that vision to be shown to us 
Pray for the portion that was sealed to be revealed to us, his servants, in these last days. Pray. Now, I want you to keep in mind what happened when Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego prayed. The Most High revealed the dream that Nebuchadnezzar saw to them. So is anything too hard for the Most High to reveal unto us what was sealed? Absolutely not. He wants us to know. We're supposed to know these things. He just said it's sealed up until the end. But let me go on. And I, Daniel, saw and behold, two others stood on one side of the bank of the river and the other on the other side of the bank of the river. And one said to the man clothed in linen, who was over the water of the river, when will be the end of the wonders which thou hast mentioned? And I heard the man clothed in linen, who was over the water of the river, and he lifted up his right hand and his left hand to heaven, and swear by him that lives forever, that it should be for a time of times and a half a time. Listen, when the dispersion is ended, they shall know all these things. Did you catch that? When the dispersion is ended, they shall know all these things. So we are supposed to know, but are we asking for it? I'm asking you to take your prayer life to a higher level. Some of you still praying, oh, Father, please bless me and my family, my four no more, bless our food. Please make sure we have enough to eat. Family, family, family. Fathers and mothers, how would you feel if every day your kids come to you praying and asking you, are we going to be able to eat today? Are we going to have enough money to keep the lights on? As a parent, you'd look at that child like, child, go sit down somewhere. Aren't we keeping a roof over your head and <laughs> buying food in this house? Why are we asking Abba Yah for things he's already done? A good father is going to look well to the needs of his people, to the needs of his children. He is a father. So you thank him for what he's already done. The fact that you're asking for it is an indication that you don't believe he is a good father who provides. Just pause and think on that. Just pause and think on that. I need you to take your prayer level to a new level, a higher level. These are the things we need to be praying about. Those Hebrew boys were praying about the mysteries. The Most High is showing him a vision that another man had. <laughs> you all, think about that. He says, when the dispersion is ended, they shall know all these things. So these are things we are supposed to know. It says, and I heard, but I understood not. And I said, oh, most high, what will be the end of these things? And he said, go, Daniel, for the words are closed and sealed up to the time of the end. So not sealed forever. It was sealed, hidden for us. But we need those with enough faith to tap in and say, show us the mysteries, show us the things that you've hidden for us, Abba Yah, because our foes are reading the tea leaves, trying to figure it out. They're using numerology, trying to figure things out. That's not how we're supposed to operate. They're tapping into a spirit, but it ain't the right spirit. <laughs> They're tapping into a spirit. If you tuned into the last live, I talked about that. 
principalities are in the heavenlies right above us. Remember before Daniel got the revel revelation, he had to, uh, this angel had to fight with the prince of Persia. They tried to block the prayers. They tried to block us from receiving answers. And some of us still don't know how to settle ourselves and sit and listen and hear and know how to tap in, how to get into that secret place where you can commune with the Father. He's talking to you, you're talking to him. Not just you going in and giving a 10 second prayer. I need this. I need, you got a whole laundry list of stuff you need, you want. I need this. Please bless me with this. And then you get up and walk out of the room. Didn't give him a chance to say a thing. Like, mm, okay. Are you treating him like Santa Claus? Hopefully not. Hopefully not. Hopefully not, family. <laughs> All right. So the Most High revealed this dream that Nebuchadnezzar saw. And as I said, we're supposed to know these things. So which nation destroyed Babylon, the head of gold? Now, I'm not talking about this mystery Babylon. I'm talking about this Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom, Babylon. Which nation destroyed Babylon? Who's going to tell me? Which nation destroyed Babylon? Persia, Charles West, Second Exodus, Medes and Persians. Okay. So it was actually a mixture of two nations, the Medes and the Persians. Cyrus would later conquer the Medes and establish the Persian Empire in 550 BC. So they kind of blended. One was basically taken over by the other. So let's talk about the Medes and the Persian. The Medes and the Persians are to be numbered among the Indo-Iranian peoples. Boy, we've been talking about a lot of Indo people, Indo-European. Now we got Indo-Iranian peoples who immigrated to the territories of Iran from the second millennium BC onwards. The Medes settled mainly in the Zagros Mountains, as well as in north and northeastern Iran, whereas the Persians settled in the region of Fars today's South Iran, with Shiraz as its capital. So sources of information about the Medes can be found in Assyrian texts. But it says ancient writers like Herod Herodotus inform us about the Medes and their capital. So it talks about what the progression was like. And they're finding a lot of these things in Iran. The history of the Medes, they say, they don't understand it all, but they thought it to be a kingdom. But now they believe that these people were like a clan, a confederation of smaller regions like tribes who were uniting together to coming, you know, to fight, uh, et cetera. So numerous wars with neighboring states were conducted in the subsequent period, especially with the Assyrians. But around 650 BC, the Scythians invaded the Median realm, ruling there for 25 years or about, round about. Now, let's look at this early prophecy concerning the Medes. It says, first mention of the Medes in scripture is found in the prophetic utterance of Isaiah when he declared 175 years before it was fulfilled, behold, I will stir up the Medes against them, which shall not regard silver and as for gold, they shall not delight in it. 
In seceding verses, the downfall of Babylon is predicted, and Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldees' excellency, shall be as when Yah overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, Jeremiah includes the Medes as one of the many nations that would be punished by the Most High. He also said that the Medes would be used to destroy Babylon. So it's referring to Jeremiah 51, 11. So it says, long before Babylon fell, it was predicted that the Medes would be the Most High's avenging instrument. But did you notice that he used another Gentile nation to destroy a Gentile nation? Keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. So Israel's restoration under Medes and Persians. While the prophetic record concerning the Medes and the Persians is clear and its fulfillment is confirmed by history, its principal importance is historical rather than prophetic. I'm going to say a few things here, so I really need you to pay attention. Things are given. They're spoken twice. So we see something happening in the natural realm, but we need to go before the Father so that we can understand the significance of what has happened in the spirit realm. For example, when I said Nebuchadnezzar was given this dream, he saw the splendor of their kingdom. Daniel was also given a dream. He saw the spiritual aspects of this dream. And he saw who the nations really are. He was given more, if you want to say, inside information. That was reserved for the people of the Most High. So in contrast to the Babylonian Empire, which is significant for its destruction of Jerusalem, in contrast to the Babylonian Empire, which is significant for its destruction of Jerusalem, beginning Gentile dominion over Israel, which will not culminate until Messiah comes in his second advent, the rise of the Medes and the Persians is important as forming the background of Israel's partial restoration. Remember, the Medes and the Persians took down Babylon. The Medes and the Persians combined. Now we have the Persians. So three, keep those thoughts in mind now. Three of the historical books, namely Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther, and three of the minor prophets, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, have their context in the reign of the Medo-Persian Empire. During this period, the captives of Judah, the captives of Judah were permitted to go back to Jerusalem and restore their ancient city and its temple. Now, this is under the Medes and the Pers Persians. The key to the Babylonian Empire is Gentile do dominion over Jerusalem. The key to the empire of the Medes and the Persians is restoration of Jerusalem. So Daniel gives a whole chapter to the account of his being cast into the lion's den. This important episode in the life of Daniel, while affording many spiritual lessons of how the Most High cares for his prophet, as well as foreshadowing the Most High's protection over the people of Israel as a whole. I hope you see the duality. He's thrown into this lion's den, but yet we see how the Most High is protecting Israel as a whole. Yes, he allowed us to be taken into captivity. He also hid us so that they wouldn't utterly destroy us. All right, I'm going to keep going because I have, like I said, so, so much to cover.
Keep in mind what I'm saying about the natural is first, because we see the historical evidence of what happened in the book of Daniel. But we need the revelation of the spiritual aspects of it. The Most High will let the Gentiles fight against each other. In the middle of the fight, he will deliver his people. We are living in the days where he is now preparing for us to be delivered out of the lands of our captivity. What's happening? He's allowing the Gentile nations to fight against each other. In the middle of the fight, he will deliver his people and the victor will play a part in that. Just like the Medes and the Persians played a part in restoring the people back to the land. So keep that thought in mind. So now we have a mixed group of Persians. Who are they? What's the difference between Iranian and Persian? You all know that Iran is Persia. So let's use its biblical name. That's who they are. Them folks, Persians, a mixture of them because they've blended. But let's read this because this is going to be significant. As I go through this, you'll understand what I'm saying. Let's read this from thoughtco.com. The terms Iranian and Persian are often used interchangeably to describe people from Iran. And some people think they mean the same thing. But is one term correct? The terms Persian and Iranian don't necessarily mean the same thing. Some people draw a distinction in that Persian relates to a particular ethnicity and being Iranian is a claim to a certain nationality. Thus, a person could be one without being the other. Persia was the official name of Iran in the Western world prior to 1935. You all, they just changed it not that long ago. When the country and vast surrounding lands were known as Persia, derived from the ancient kingdom of Parsa and the Persian Empire. However, Persian people within their country have long called it Iran, often spelled with the E, Iran. In 1935, the name Iran came into existence internationally. So the Gentile nations have been muddying the waters, changing the names of characters, mixing up the people. So you, you think this people is one thing, but no, the original people is somewhere else. They've been muddying the waters is what they've been doing. So it says, generally, Persia today refers to Iran because the country formed over the center of the ancient Persian Empire and the majority of its original citizens inhabited that land. Modern Iran is comprised of a large number of different ethnic and tribal groups. People who identify as Persian account for the majority, but there are also large numbers, and they list all these other folks. While all are citizens of Iran, on, only some can identify their lineage in Persia. Okay, so hopefully you got that. Let's go on. Are they Arabs? No, they're not. Persians are not Arabs. Most people think that they are, just like a lot of people think thought that Turkey were Arabs. That is, that is so true, the whole truth. You just said it. This is why we can't identify our enemies. 
That's what I'm getting to. That's exactly right. They are disguising themselves. We need to know who we're dealing with in these last days. So we need to know who they are. They are not Arabs. The Turks are not Arabs. So it says Arab people live in the Arab world make up, made up of 22 countries in the Middle East and North Africa, including Algeria, Bahrain, the Comoros Islands, Djibouti, Egypt, or Djibouti, Egypt, Iraq, Jordan, Kuwait, Lebanon, Libya, Morocco, Mauritania, Oman, Palestine, and more. Persians live in Iran to the Indus River of Pakistan and to Turkey in the West. Listen, Arabs trace their ancestry to the original inhabitants of tribes of Arabia from the Syrian desert and Arabian Peninsula. Persians are part of the Iranian inhabitants. Family, if you listen to the session on Sunday, remember the Turks called um, the Afro-Turks Arabs or Arab, meaning blacks, the blacks. The original Arabs are dark, melanated, black-skinned people. Keep that in mind as we go along. So they're not Arabs. <laughs> the original people in these lands, all of these lands, have been displaced and placed under subjection, just like the Native Americans here. The Native Americans and a lot of uh, Hebrews, uh, Hamites, were here. They were dark-skinned, melanated people. So it's not a stretch for me to know that some of our people were already here. That's not a stretch. But to, but to say only here and folks getting all upset, it's this land why then is he saying you're they're going to be enslaving the land that's not theirs, but we're not going to go there. Bro. That'll take us into another, another topic. So let's go on. All right. So let's look at this. Persians, their origins, Aryans, and chariots. So Iranians or Persians are an Indo-European people who descended from Aryan tribes, as many Indians and Europeans have, not all Native Americans or Indians, many. They are not Arabs or Turks and are offended if they are confused with Arabs. You know why? They don't associated with us. Over the centuries, modern Iranians have mixed and intermarried with the people of South Asia, Central Asia, and the Arab Peninsula, and people who traveled on the Silk Road between China and Europe. Do you remember when I did the session on um, Blocchiamento in Brazil, and they would only allow um, Europeans, white Europeans or Asians in, and they wanted them to mix with the people to wipe them out. So Persian Farsi is the official language of Iran. It is an Indo-European language like English, French, and German. Pause and think on that. Mm -hmm. So the early Persians, the original Persians were members of Aryan tribes that arrived from the Central Asia and the Caucasus with sheep and horses in the second millennium BC. 
driving out an earlier agricultural civilization. They made their home on Iranian plateau at a time when the Middle East was dominated by ancient Egypt, Mesopotamia, and Assyria, black looking folk. <laughs> These people spoke an Indo-European language and call themselves Irani. The name Persian comes from Greek geographers who named them after the province of Parsa or Persis. The Persians and their close relatives, the Medes, dominated present-day Iran beginning around 1000 BC. I hope you're getting this. In 612 BC, an alliance of Medes, Scythians, and Chaldeans, oh my, here we go again, these folks. They defeated the Assyrians by besieging and destroying the Assyrian capital of Nineveh. The Medes then created an empire that ruled the Persians to the east and the Assyrians to the west. It was the first of many great Persian empires. So who are we dealing with here, family? Indo-Europeans. Indo-Europeans. We need to understand who these people are in these last days. So it says immigration of the Medes and Persians, small groups of nomadic horse riding peoples speaking Indo-European languages began moving into the Iranian cultural area from Central Asia. Again, who are we talking about? Three major groups are identifiable the Scythians, the Medes, and the Persians. The Scythians established themselves in the northern Zagros Mountains and clung to a semi-nomadic semi existence in which raiding, raiding was the chief form of economic enterprise. Hmm. Hmm. All right, we're going to keep going. Like I said, we have a lot to unpack. We need to know who these people are. The Indo-Europeans around 3000 BC during the early Bronze Age, Indo-European people began migrating into Europe, into Europe, Iran, and India. And India, you all and mixed with the local people who eventually adopted their language. In Greece, these people were divided into fledg fledgling city-states from which the Mycenaeans and later the Greeks evolved. These Indo-European European people are believed to have been relatives of the Aryans who migrated or invaded India and Asia Minor. Listen, the Hittites and later the Greeks, Roman Celts, and nearly all Europeans and North Americans descend from Indo-European people. Indo-Europeans is the general name for the people speaking Indo-European languages. These are the descendants of the people of the Yamnaya culture. In Ukraine and Southern Russia, who settled in the area from Western Europe to India in various migrations in the third, second, and early millenniums, millenniums BC. They are the answers of ancestors, I'm sorry, of Persians pre-Homeric Greeks, Teutons, and Celts. Hmm. So Indo-European intrusions into Iran and Asia Minor, talking about Anatolia, Turkey, began about 3000 BC. 
The Indo-European tribes originated in the great central Eurasian plains and spread into the Danube River Valley. So family, here's what I'm getting you to see. All of these people, the original people who were in these lands, they're in the shadows. These people that we see are not the original people. They are Gentile powers. They're branches from the same tree. So Aryan charioteers from northern Iran. So again, it's telling us that these Aryan Indo-European charioteers from the steppes of northern Iran conquered India. Aryan tribes also gave birth to early civilizations in Greece, Europe, and India and were master charioteers. So the original people from India, some of their skin is blacker than ours, darker, much darker. The Aryans were a loosely federated semi-nomadic herdsmen people who spread both east and west from Central Asia, taking their sky gods with them. These are the ancestors of the Persians. I hope you're getting this. We have not, we have been confused trying to figure out who these people are. And they purposely mixed up. They take on the identity and the names of the people when they go in and colonize the place. It says the Aryans introduced the horse-drawn chariot, the Hindu religion and sacred books known as the Vedas to present-day India. The term Aryan has been used by European writers since 1835, but fell into disfavor in the mid-20th century because of its association with Nazi propaganda, which described the people of Northern and Central Europe as being the purest representatives of an Aryan race, but they, the lie about white supremacy, of, of course, we know that's a lie, but they are of an Aryan race. They're Indo-Europeans. They're Indo-Europeans. And it's hard to understand these prophecies when we don't know who the players are. Now listen to this, this last part. The Aryans had advanced bronze weapons, later iron weapons, and horse-drawn chariots with light-spoked wheels. The native people, the conquered at best, had ox carts and often only Stone Age weapons. But here's the thing. When you think about how Esau would conquer it would be the warfare. And that's how these people conquered. They came in with weaponry, advanced weaponry. Just think about that. This is how they conquer. And this is how they rule. So listen to this. <laughs> In the session on Sunday, we talked about the Afro-Turks. And I also showed you that the Turkish people are not Arabs because they consider the Arabs to be Blacks. So Iranians originated in the same place as the Turks. But we still have people there, our people. So let's look at this. It says, we are Iranians rediscovering the history of African slavery in Iran. And it says Afro-Iranians view themselves as Iranians and are sometimes upset by questions about their African origins. But let's keep reading. It says, with shards of ancient pottery recovered from the mountains of Iran, Sistine, and Balkhul, yeah, whatever that word is, province, colorful vases from Ishfashan and tribal masks 
from Zanzibar adorning the shells, it is easy to see why. Ms. Rye has spent nearly 20 years studying the origins of the African diaspora in Iran, including the history and eventual abolition of slavery in her native country. It was a topic that few knew about in the late 1990s when she began her research and one that remains unfamiliar to many today. Living in Iran for all my life, we had never heard about slavery in Iran. Never? They did the same thing in Turkey. No, it's again, you don't even talk about it. Do you see the pattern? They don't know who they are. They don't know who they are, family. All right, let's read this. Tracing Roots, Uncovering the Descendants of Ishmael in Arab History and Genealogy. Ishmael was the first son of the prophet Abraham, according to both Islamic and biblical history. His mother was Hagar, the Egyptian maidservant of Abraham's wife, Sarah. The story goes that Sarah was unable to bear children, so we know what happened there. According to Islamic tradition, Ishmael and his mother were banished to the desert after Sarah gave birth to her son Isaac. The family settled in the Arabian Peninsula, where Ishmael became the father of 12 sons who founded the Arab tribes. And this is why the Europeans, the Indo-Europeans, Iraq, I'm sorry, Iran, Iran, and Turks tell you we are not Arabs. It says these tribes went on to form the foundation of Arab culture, language, and tradition. So the true Arabs, the original are going to be dark, melanated people. They're going to look like their father, Abraham. Not only them, those sons that Abraham had with Keturah. These are all Hebrews. They're not Israelites, but they are Hebrew people. So make sure you understand that. So, Notice that there is a distinction. The Indo-Europeans want nothing to do with the black skin color. Nothing to do with it. So initially we called it the Arab and transatlantic slave trade. I think the more appropriate term is the European slave trade. Because all of these nations, family, were Indo-Europeans involved in this transatlantic slave trade. Yes, we had nations taking our people, other folks, and even some that look like us, some of Esau's folks as well. Same color skin, but they are not us. Hmm. The slave trading past of these nations inflicted immense suffering on the rest of the world. They enslaved millions of people and trafficked them to the four corners. Trafficked our people to the four corners, just like scripture said. Now, what's interesting is, even though the UN says the slave trade is described as a crime against humanity, why is it that none of the nations involved are held accountable? Why is that? Because they're the same people. And that's the part we've been missing. They're the same people. 
But we need to understand that the Most High is setting things up to reveal those who are his. He's revealing those who are his versus those who are not in these last days. Because as his people, we're not supposed to be deceived. Not when we can tap in and get the information from the source. Daniel and his friends prayed and the Most High revealed things to them. So the book of Daniel in conjunction with the book of Revelation gives us an account of what is to come. But there were some hidden things hidden for us. Do we have enough faith to ask for it? The Most High is already positioning the nations and placing it in the hearts of leaders who will assist with the regathering of his people, just like he did with Cyrus. The Medes and Persians took down Babylon. So even now, he's putting it in the heart of these Gentile nations, certain ones, to assist with the regathering of his people. In the meantime, the nations that will be judged for enslaving and trafficking us around the world are being drawn to the place of their destruction. A hook has been placed in their nose. They're being drawn to the valley of Jehoshaphat. Even though they are Indo-Europeans, they represent Babylon. That's what we need to understand. Even though they're Indo-European, they represent Babylon. Everything that's happening right now is serving a purpose. Even all the gaslighting about our history, these things provide an opportunity for self-incrimination. They don't know that. Those who are saying, well, nobody today can be held accountable for slavery, they didn't do it. The fact is, if you know that the, the deeds were evil and that they were done, they know that the nations benefited from it, why wouldn't the nations try to make it right? No, all of the nations involved hold themselves blameless. They are hiding the history not realizing that all of the things leading up to now was revealing the heart of the descendants of those who were involved. Everything they're saying right now, everything they're doing right now, trying to erase the history, everything is being recorded. Many are revealing who they are. So even though they say they're not responsible because they were not alive when their ancestors did it, they benefited tremendously and they've still been reaping the dividends, residual income. But here's the thing I need you to also understand, family. There are some from those days who also helped our people. And that's the part we cannot overlook. Some of them knew it was evil and they, they did the right thing. They tried to put an end to it. Some of them risked their lives like Rahab, like Rahab put her life on the line. And some of those folks, Gentile folks, lost their lives because they knew it was wrong their descendants will also reap good benefits. The Most High is just family. He kept records. He knows who those families are. He saw that what their ancestors did was also recorded. It was also recorded. So we need to understand, we can't try to lump everybody together and say all. Oh. He's kept a record of who's who and who did what. So let these people talk who are speaking against us, gaslighting, saying this, that, and the other, 
you know, making jokes and cartoons, let it's being recorded, self-incrimination. They will have to give an answer for it. But chances are they descended from people who did some of the evil deeds. And that stuff has passed down. Remember, they were in the loins of their ancestors. They were in their loins. So everything they say and the things they do, just know there's a record being kept. There's a record in the kingdom of heaven. And when this is all said and done, the nations involved will be caught with stolen goods. The people are still in the land of their captivity. Just think about that. So there is evidence that will be used against them. I want to wrap up with these passages. Something for us to keep in mind. This comes from 2 Baruch, the seventh, uh, 72nd chapter. And I want, as I read these, because Baruch was writing to our people when they were in captivity. But I want you to listen carefully to these words, because remember, there are some things that have a double meaning. A lot of it pertained to them then, but some is for us today. Here now also regarding the bright lightning, which is to come at the consummation after these black waters. This is the word. Now, this particular word is for us. This is a last day message. After the signs have come, of which you were told before, when the nations become turbulent and the time of my Mashiach is come, he shall both summon all the nations and some of them he shall spare and some of them he shall slay. These things therefore shall come upon the nations which are to be spared by him. Every nation which knows not Yasharel and has not trodden down the seed of Yaakov shall indeed be spared. This because some out of every nation shall be subjected to your people. Where have we heard that before? Some of them will cleave and become servants to Israel. They'll serve in, serve us. But all those who have ruled over you or have known you, and that known you is talking about those who colonize and mistreated, abuse, etc., shall be given up to the sword. I hope you got that. So think about what I just said. There are some all Europeans or all other folks don't hate us. The problem is it's hard for us to know who they are. So I've been praying for the most high to expose the true motives of the heart. And the environment that they're that we're living in right now is setting the stage for that. I I want them to be exposed. I we don't need anybody trying to cleave to us who should not be there. None. <laughs> But those who have good intentions, it says every nation which knows not, they have not trodden down the seed of Yaakov. They're going to be spared. Notorious Hebrew said there's a bunch of people digging, <laughs> digging ditches right now. How you doing, elephant man? Good to see you. Let's keep going. This is the prophecy they seem to ignore from Joel 3, 9 through 12. It says, proclaim ye this among the Gentiles. 
prepare war? Who's supposed to be proclaiming? We are. We, you think they're going to declare war on themselves? <laughs> they don't want to talk about this. They're trying to hide the stolen goods. Proclaim ye this among the Gentiles. Prepare war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Assemble yourselves and come all ye heathen and gather yourselves together round about. Child, the hook is in their nose. What you see right now, they can't help it. They're being led to a place. They're being led somewhere. He says, gather yourselves together round about. Thither cause thy mighty ones to come down, O Most High. Let the heathen be awakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. Come on down because I'm going to deal with you. It says, for there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. Let's listen to this, 2nd Baruch 78, 2-6. through six. Thus says Baruch, the son of Neriahu, to the brethren carried into captivity, mercy and peace. I bear in mind, my brethren, the love of him who created us, who loved us from of old and never hated us, but above all, educated us. Yeah, we went to the school of hard knocks. I'm just... <laughs> We got the royal beat down in that school. Like you going to learn today. <laughs> oh, my word. Our behinds are still hurting. <laughs> Yo. He didn't hate us. He did. He was educating us. It says, and truly, I know that behold, all we, the 12 tribes, are bound by one bond, inasmuch as we are born from one father. Wherefore, I have been the more careful to leave you the words of this sefer before I die, that you may be comforted regarding the evils which have come upon you, and that you may be grieved also regarding the evil that has befallen your brethren and again also that ye may be that you may justify his judgment which he has decreed against you we need to know that the most high is just in everything that he did concerning us a father took his kids out to the woodshed <laughs> oh word Oh, my word. Look, I don't know that we're going to forget this weapon, family. <laughs> it was brutal. But again, it is displaying his justice because the other nations can't say we did wicked things and got away with it. They are going to have to acknowledge that the Most High dealt with his kids. And my, 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 if he dealt with us that way, um, those nations that are being called down to the Valley of Jehoshaphat, mm, 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 mm. Phantom says, bring me a switch from that tree. <laughs> I know that's right. So we need to declare that he has been just in his judgment, which he has decreed against you, that you should be carried away captives for what you have suffered is dis disproportioned to what you have done in order that at the last time you may be found worthy of your fathers. It was for our own good. Didn't you just hate when parents used to say that when they whip you? This is for your own good. This is going to hurt me more than it hurts you. Like, really? <laughs> oh, my goodness. It says, therefore, if you consider 
that you have now suffered those things for your good, that you may not finally be condemned and tormented. Then you will receive eternal hope. If above all you destroy from your heart vain error on account of which you departed hence. Remember why we were taken captive. It wasn't because we were doing what we should have been doing. No, we were chastised because we were not. For if you so do these things, he will continually remember you. He who always promised on our behalf to those who were more excellent than, than we. This is what he told our, forefam our forefather's family. He made some promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that he would never forget or forsake us. But with much mercy, will gather together again those who were dispersed. Mm. Those are comforting words. Baruch 82, 1 through 2, second Baruch. Therefore, my brethren, I have written to you that you may comfort yourselves regarding the multitude of your tribulations. For no that our maker will assuredly, assuredly avenge us on all our enemies, according to all that they have done to us. Also, that the consummation which the Most High will make is very nigh, is close at hand, and his mercy that is coming, and the consummation of his judgment is by no means far off. So it's coming because his word will not return unto him void. It will not. It will not. Joanne says, if we have not learned a lesson by now, don't know what to say. I <laughs> know that's right. When a whooping runs through the bloodline and down the generations, you don't want to mess with the most. I know that's right. I know that's right. Mr. The Original School and undeserving are we bitter herbs. Wow. Minister Glenette says amen to that. All praise to y'all. Hallelujah. We are right there, family. All right, Dwayne, Ronald Dalton brought it out. Yes, he did. And, and you, we, we need to understand that the Most High is um, having certain people focus on certain thing. They're not all covering the same thing. It's, it's like looking at it from all angles, covering dif different aspects of it, of it so that we can get the full picture of it. Thank you, thank you, thank you, you all for your um, super stickers, Carla, white collar chick, the whole truth, so help me, Brother Calvin, Willie Baker, uh, Joseph Milligan, Diamond Love, Eric, Margarita, V. Hannah, Minister Glenette. Thank you, sis, for that comment. Thank you for being such a blessing. Thank you. Pride of Judah, Shia, and J. Smith. Thank you to all of you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Family, yeah, I, we had a lot to cover, but I got through it. Got through it. So I'm going to confess right now. <laughs> I, uh, I was preparing for this session tonight, and I started days ago, days ago. Because I had like the base, basic outline and I just really wanted to focus on, you know, what was going on over there right now. I had all the materials. I had my maps and, and it's uh, like, OK, I believe this is what I'm supposed to cover. And I'm preparing and getting near to the end, like, OK, I'm almost done with this and things are just not flowing. You can tell. <laughs> Things are just not flowing. I'm like, okay, so I need to get this part. And it's like, 
looking for stuff was like, no, nah, that's not flowing. And <laughs> last night before I went to bed, I said, okay, well, I just need a few more slides. I think I got what I need to cover. I'm about ready. Got up bright and early this morning, it's like five-ish. And I'm trying to wrap this up <laughs> before I go to the office. And I put the flash drive in and it says, cannot open this file, it's corrupted. I'm like, say what? You know, at that point, that's when you try to rebuke demons like, oh no, I spent like how many hours, you know? So I'm like, where's the stuff? So I'm trying to get this flash drive to work, taking things out, restarting things. And it wouldn't, it's like, file is corrupted. We cannot open this file. I'm like, all of those files are gone. <laughs> and I got this live tonight. Oh my gosh, that's when you go into deep intercession. And then I was politely reminded about what I had been, what had been spoken or dropped into my heart days ago that I wrote down in my journal. And I'm like, so it appears I got off track and you really got my attention on this one. <laughs> like, I'm like, I mean, really to destroy the whole file? Like you had to do me like that? <laughs> I was too hurt this morning. I'm like, I got to start over. <laughs> yes, you got to start over. Because in this hour, we need to make sure we're saying what he wants us to say. But I, it's like, okay, but I know this stuff is in, is in alignment with, you know, what I've, I've been covering in the series <laughs> and all the information. This is in line. That has happened to me, I wanna say maybe th three times when I first started doing this. And I've been, ha I had to sit up to like one or two in the morning and redo stuff. Cause it's like, nope, that that's not it. <laughs> that's not it. But I really thought I was on it this morning. So you all, we, I'm about to wrap up here cause sister's about to go to bad Sharon said I would have cried I had to laugh to keep from crying <laughs> I had to laugh it's like oh my you had to do me like that <laughs> just corrupt the whole file I couldn't even open it and I thought I had some good stuff had all my journal articles oh yes I was going in on what was going on in the Middle East. <laughs> but it's like, mm -mm, that's not it. <laughs> Go back to the journal <laughs> and see what was written in there. <laughs> Jesus, stop, stop it, my stomach hurt. Look, <laughs> your stomach hurt. <laughs> Oh, y'all, I had to confess. I just had to go ahead and tell it. Y'all pray for me. <laughs> just pray for me. He had said, y'all had another plan. Yes, he did. And I was reminded that we all have our portion. So he has other um, Israelites focusing on different things, other topics, and they're covering, you know, certain asp aspects of it. We have to learn how to stay in our own lane. <laughs> but confess your sins one to another, <laughs> y'all. So y'all heard it. Yep, I, I I got it this morning. I had to go into the woodshed, y'all. <laughs> I can laugh now, family, but we have to be obedient to what he's given us to do. We have to be obedient. This is what was supposed to come forth. We have to know who these people are. This is important for us to know because they have been disguising themselves and pretending to be folks, taking on the identity of folks. And we need to know who we're looking at. We need to know who we're looking at. 
So family, I do hope the, the messages um, are being a blessing to you that you're learning some things from the series. Please, please, please share these messages because you all know what we're up against. You all, ooh, the shadow banning is fierce. I'm just trying to tell you. Sometimes I'll um, get into the mash, uh, dashboard and I'll see comments just a whole bunch of comments and then things disappear like what happened to all those comments y'all y'all you know what we're dealing with so remember to share these things because it, you all have to help to get the word out i'm still having folks like i never even heard of this channel like oh my god how am i just now finding out about the channel so share it like the videos and share it with folks but just remember that the Most High wants us to know the things that are coming. He wants to reveal the mysteries and the things to us in these last days. So make sure you're praying, praying that he will reveal it so that um, we don't fall for the deception. We, we do not have to be deceived when we can go to the source. Alma says, you probably did have some good stuff, but probably for another time, Rolanda, y'all enlarge your understanding and willingness to share praises to his name. Yes, keep me lifted up, y'all, because sometimes, yeah, I get called to the woodshed too. <laughs> Beauty with brains, I've been noticing like numbers staying the same. Yeah, it, it's been happening. It's been happening. It's, it's like, okay, most I got it. He's got it. Uh, Yabu, thank the Most High. Yes, praise his name. Praise his name. Praise his name. Uh, Janet, the lessons are great. Glad. I I'm happy. I'm, I'm learning something. It's like a history lesson for me. Some of the stuff is like, oh my gosh. Yes. Oh my goodness. Um, Vita, sympathy for the devil. You need a new name, please. It can be misleading. The name? Love you for real. Just trying to help. The name, I'm trying to understand what you mean by the name. Um, Courtney says, give them double. Uh, yes. Elephant man, I pray that all is well with you, brother. Pray that all is well. So, Les, uh, Wind Walker, we're still in Babylon. Um <clears throat> Bryant, this message was a linchpin to other teachings. Well, praises to the Most High for that. Trying to get through some of these because I knew you. Were, I could see the comments flowing through, but I couldn't stop. <laughs> I had to keep it going. Had to keep it going. Second Exodus. It's amazing how Palestinians and those folks can delete each other, but still lie to the world about our identity. Mm -hmm. And just know that some of our folks are caught up in there too now. Yes. We have some folks in there too. Um, let's see. Hold true. Thanks for another live sessions. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for joining me. All right. So family, it is 948. I'm about to wrap up here. Even my mother last time was like, you went two whole hours. You never go two hours. <laughs> So we're going to wrap up right here, family. You all be blessed. Have an amazing week. Keep your head up. Don't let everything that's happening around the world get to you. Don't let it get to you. You need to know that the Most High Yah has got this. He's got it. You don't need to um, allow yourself to be discouraged to be dismayed, to be fretting. You don't need to be fretting, family. You don't need to fret. Ble many blessings to you, uh, Jay Smith. Many blessings to you. I praise the Most High for all of you who support and bless the ministry. Thanks to you all. All right. We're going to end it right here. Join me next time.